Carolyn Warmus was born on January 8, 1964 in Troy, Michigan. Her father was a self-made millionaire, so Carolyn and her family were able to live in an affluent suburb of Detroit. Her parents were married but got divorced when Carolyn turned eight. She did well in school and went on to college at the University of Michigan, majoring in psychology. During her college years, that is when she started dabbling in the dating scene. Her major was of no help and her relationships all failed. Most of the breakups were because men said that she exhibited obsessive behavior. Carolyn got into the habit of stalking men she was interested in and even her boyfriends. Along with the stalking, she would often hire private investigators in order to keep tabs on her boyfriends. One ex in particular by the name of Paul Lavin could not keep Carolyn away from him even after they broke up and he got into a new relationship. By the time he got engaged and completely moved on from Carolyn, Carolyn would still stalk him and reach out not only to him but his fiance as well. Carolyn would reach out to Paul's friends and even spread lies that she was pregnant by him. All of the chaos she was causing forced Paul to file a restraining order against her. Upon graduating from the University of Michigan, Carolyn moved to New York City, New York. One night, she went out to a bar in New Jersey and met a married man by the name of Vincent Parco. Vincent, although married, entertained Carolyn but soon lost interest in her and decided not to talk to her anymore. Carolyn's obsessive behavior came out again and she hired another private investigator to follow Vincent around. After a while, she was able to move on from Vincent while focusing on school to get her master's. She was able to obtain her master's in elementary education from Columbia University and in September 1987, she acquired her first teaching job at Greenville Elementary School in Scarsdale, New York. It was here at Greenville Elementary she met her new lover, married man Paul Solomon. Paul was married to a woman named Betty Jean and they both had a daughter named Kristen. Paul allowed Carolyn to be around his family and Kristen considered Carolyn to be her role model and big sister. Carolyn would lavish Kristen with gifts and Betty grew a liking to her as well. In late 1988, Paul broke things off with Carolyn and began a new affair with a woman named Barbara Baller. Like typical Carolyn, who could not take no for an answer, she began to stalk Paul and his family and was not able to stay away. She discovered Paul was going on vacation to Puerto Rico with his new lover, Barbara, so she purchased tickets and went to Puerto Rico as well. She found phone numbers to Barbara's family members to let them know that she was sleeping with a married man and she tried to get her family to convince her to end the relationship with Paul. Carolyn had enough of Paul and she reached out to her ex whom she stalked, Vincent Parco. Vincent gave Carolyn a 25 caliber gun. Carolyn then used an ID from a co-worker she worked with during a short summer job. The ID belonged to a Lisa Katai. With the ID, Carolyn was able to purchase ammo for the 25 caliber gun on January 15, 1989 at a Ray's sport shop in North Plainfield, New Jersey at 3 p.m. That same day, Carolyn made it to Paul's condo where Betty was home alone. Carolyn was let in and then hit Betty and fatally shot her multiple times. Moments before Betty died, she was able to call 911 at 7.15 p.m., but the call disconnected. The operator heard the caller saying, she's trying to kill me. The operator tried to do a reverse search, but the directory had the wrong address. It wasn't until 11.42 that night when Paul came home and discovered his dead wife on the floor. He immediately phoned 911. It's my wife. I think she's dead. I need help. My name is Paul Solomon. She's not moving. She's covered with blood. Please hurry. When police arrived, they questioned him and he was quoted saying, I got home. The first thing I heard was the TV on very loud. I walked into the living room. The lights were out. I noticed that Betty Jean was on the floor. I assumed she was asleep. I touched her and she was cold. I went and turned the lights on. I turned her over and there was blood. I thought she had fallen and hit her head. Initially, police suspected Paul, but he had an alibi where witnesses were able to corroborate his story. Their focus then shifted to Carolyn when Paul mentioned he had a stalker. Detectives discovered that Vincent let Carolyn borrow his gun and they also interviewed Lisa Kitai because her ID was the one used at Ray's sports shop. Lisa told them that she had never purchased any ammo, but she did previously work with Carolyn and her ID was stolen that summer. Carolyn was arrested, but her millionaire father posted her $250,000 bail during her February 2, 1990 indictment of second degree murder at the Westchester County Courthouse. After her 12-day trial, the jury was deadlocked at 8 to 4, 
Eight jurors were in favor of a conviction, but because the decision was not unanimous, the judge declared a mistrial on April 27, 1991. Carolyn's second trial started in January 1992. For this second trial, new evidence was presented that sealed her fate. A bloody glove that belonged to Carolyn was seen in a crime scene photo. After six days of deliberation, a jury unanimously found Carolyn guilty of second-degree murder on May 26, 1992. The judge presiding over the case, Judge John Carey, was quoted saying, Carolyn committed a hideous act, a most extreme and illegal murder. The minimum sentence Carolyn could have faced was 15 years and the max was 25. Judge Carey sentenced Carolyn to the max of 25 years to life in prison with the possibility of parole. She was sent to the Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women. Carolyn was indeed a wicked woman. She was eligible for parole in 2017, but it was denied. But later on, she was released from prison on June 17, 2019. She served a total of 27 years in prison for the murder and for the illegal possession of a firearm. Thank you all for watching another episode of Wicked Women. Do you think Carolyn will exhibit the same obsessive behavior tendencies while out of prison? With no reform or therapy, how can a behavior like that be corrected?